Hey gang, we are on the Grand Adventure today. I am eastbound from Chicago on probably what is going to be a seven hour drive going to a tiny city in central eastern Ohio called Gann, G-A-N-N. -N. And it is there in 1881, early 1881, that many, many newspapers reported that there was a grave robbery that took place there. However, in this case, the grave robbers were, well, one of them, who was called the Dipper, was actually killed by what is called a torpedo device that they used to plan to try to prevent grave robbery. It wasn't a common thing, but it was something that happened, and I think this is the only reported case of someone being killed, the other guy being mangled, and the third guy in what was called in the article the Slay, was able to get the other two out, but I guess the Dipper didn't make it, the grave robber. So we're on our way there. We have some clues as to whose grave this was. Late 1880 burial, you have to figure. We have to thank Deb from our channel. She's one of our genealogist helpers. And with that, we're going to maybe talk to some of the locals, try to get there on the ground and piece things together and go to the grave where it happened. So we'll be checking right back in when we get closer or when we get there. Eastern Central Ohio, and we are approaching the town of Gann. It's also called Brink Haven, Brink Haven. I don't know if that's a more recent name. Very hilly country here. It's been 30 miles of back roads. This is, uh, I just did get on this little highway here and very narrow roads. A lot of signs of Amish community. We're gonna turn left up here. We're just crossing the bridge of this, this river. It says Brinkhaven. I don't really see any town, so to speak. There are a few houses. So let's see what we, let's see what's going on here. There's a wildlife center here on the left, which says Mohican River, Mohican River Wildlife Area, and a very steep hill. So again, you're seeing this for the first time. Like me, we are. And there are some, uh, looks like some very old houses here. Look at this. It's so beautiful. I'm sure that dates back to the 1800s. The time we're talking, there's another beautiful home here that looks very, very old. Town's in great shape, so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drive around a little bit and see if I see anybody outside and strike up a conversation and We'll see where things go. This is just kind of ad lib. And of course we'll end up at the cemetery. Look at that. Oh, that's a turkey vulture, guys. So if you ever want to know what a turkey vulture looks like, I will zoom in on that for you. They are they are not really the, uh, the prettiest of... Uh, hold on, here we go. They are not really the prettiest of Actually, I thought it was a goose at first. So there you go, turkey vulture. It does look like a turkey head, doesn't it? All right, let's skedaddle. All right, let's see what we can find here. But he could pull Phil you in on a lot of issues. Who's that? What's his name? David Greer. Okay. Is he old timer? David Greer. Well, he ain't that old timer, but he, right, he, but he knows the history. Yeah, he knows the history of everything around. Where does he live? He lives down in Danville. Somewhere. Danville, okay, yeah. so not here. Yeah. David Greer, I'll try to remember, I'll try to call him up. Yeah. What's your name, by the way? Larry George. Larry, thanks so much. Well, you're quite welcome. Okay, so I just talked to a woman, an elderly woman, who's been here practically her whole life and she actually gave me the correct location of the cemetery. Some interesting things. 
There was a flood here in 1913 and a lot of people drowned and died. I guess the river, this, I guess it's called the Mohican overflowed. And there's a guy here that has a lot of pictures of that history, but he's not here. I tried to, uh, he lived, uh, he lives across the street, but he's not here that much. He has all that history from his mom. Anyway, so we're going to go check out this uh, cemetery right now. And we'll see, we'll see what we find next. Okay gang, we finally found the right road. A very steep climb here. The river is to the right and it's like a cliff that goes straight down. And they said the cemetery is up here. I actually think it might be up here to the left. Wow, to the right, I'm glad they got the, oh yeah, here it is. There's the cemetery. Yeah, let's check it out. All right, we found it. Oh yeah, we're in. Look at this. All right, let's go see. Okay, gang. We are ready to take a walk. What do you say? I am thinking that as I look around, it looks like this part of the cemetery is pretty new judging by the gravestones. And as I look more over there, it's, that looks like older. Let's start there. Let's, let's take a walk. Now we're looking for the grave of William Maxwell. Why are we looking for William? Well, Deb was able to find his grave and hopefully he is here. We don't have an exact location from find a grave and find a grave has maybe 60 percent or maybe 70 percent of these graves here and that is the only grave that he died in December of 1880. Why is that important? Well if you look at all the newspaper articles that article was written and syndicated in 1881 January. So that means the grave that was robbed probably, that person was probably interred in the, the prior month or so. Just like the Marilla story, that previous episode, it was about within two to three weeks. And that's what the resurrectionists wanted to do. They wanted to dig up the loose soil and they wanted the fresh corpse. And again, why did they want that? Because they wanted to sell it to the doctors. It was for the anatomy and they would pay a lot of money for these bodies so it was quite a trade. Now let's keep our eye open here for William. We're going to be checking a lot of these stones here. Now what I'm going to do is, I think what I'm going to do is work my way back that way first and then uh, 
I'm going to work my way back that way first and then we'll circle we'll circle our way back this way. So if we check the other cemeteries in this general area which is not even, you know, within a mile or two of here, there's no graves that are late 1880. So the odds are good that Maxwell, I think better than 50-50 or 50-50 maybe, that his grave, he's the one that had the torpedo devices that killed and injured these men. So again, we had three men who came here in Jan well in December, so there was snow because it does reference that there was a sleigh. They had a sleigh, so a horse and sleigh. And one of the men, again, his name was Dipper, he was killed as his spade, as he was digging. And the other gentleman, unnamed, was maimed. His legs were mangled. And the third man who was keeping watch was uninjured, of course, and he got the other two guys out. I mean, these men were apparently never caught. Who knows what happened? I mean, the, the report, if you, if you go on newspapers.com, you can easily find it by just referencing grave robbing and GAN, G-A-N-N. So, who knows what happened to those guys, the other two guys, but, you know, the one guy died. Now, this torpedo device that they used in those days, there's, as I know, there's only one surviving uh, device, and the people that, the guy that bought it from a garage sale didn't even know what it was when he bought it, and... It took a lot of research and they finally figured out that it was a Civil War era device, but that it was 90% a grave torpedo. Now, torpedo in those days was kind of like a landmine. This was before submarines. And again, in the 1900s, we gathered that term, torpedo. But it used to be for these, like, hand grenade ground bombs, or, mine, you know, we, we call them mines today. So don't be confused why it's called a torpedo, because it was not propelled. It was in the ground. And the way it worked is it looked like a round, kind of like a small pineapple. And it was filled with black powder. And the triggering device, it had a flash cap. And it was like a lever. And that lever would, you know, you would step on it or something would hit it and it would set off a spring device and set off the charge. And presumably these would be buried within just inches in the loose soil. Now here are a bunch of stones stacked up here. Interesting. There we see a couple of the symbols. The Masons, we see here. And we see the husband-wife handshake. This is Susan. We've seen, we've seen that handshake before. Can't see the death date, let's see. Sixty-nine? Sixty-nine years old, I believe. All right, so far I'm not seeing Maxwell. We're looking for Maxwell, guys. Now the picture on Find a Grave does not show the entire stone. It just shows the face of the stone. So it could really be any one of these. Hmm. All right, we've got 
got a number of more that we can look at. A lot of cool stone spheres. I want to check into the history. Apparently there was a flood in 1913, I think she said, or 1923, I can't remember, but there was a big flood and a lot of people died here. Of course, on the other side of that river, a lot, some of those homes, they're, they're just above the, the river bank. And you could see, maybe there's something on Google. If there is, I'll, I'll reference some pictures and a little bit about the history of that. Don't see Maxwell. Yeah, this is definitely the old part of the cemetery. No, that's not Maxwell. It says, I'm not sure what that says. Schlosser. Some beautiful stones. Look at this one. A beautiful design. Yeah, the dipper, the dipper. The dipper paid the price. He paid the price trying to steal bodies. They would come at night. And it was, like I said in the Marilla episode, it was teams of three, one to watch the grave and the graveyard or the cemetery and uh, be at a distance with the means of conveyance, which was the horse and carriage or the sleigh, I guess, in this case. And the other two would do the work with the tarp. I'll put a reference to that episode if you want to know exactly how they did their job, specifically. It's very interesting, their means and methods. That's part three of the Marilla grave robbery. Quite gruesome, using the tarp and the candle or lantern under the tarp. And just all the little tricks they would play come here as a hunter, hunting rabbits during the day, locate the grave. Everyone's like, oh, he's just a hunter. Stuff like that, it's, it's interesting. And then they would whisk the body away after, and here's, here's an example, I don't see Maxwell yet, but what they would do, here's a good example. So, assumably, presumably, at the head of the headstone, that's why they call it a headstone, right here underground, maybe four or six feet down, is the, in this case, the coffin. And they would only dig a two or three feet by three foot hole, square, or just a hole. Once they hit the coffin, they would break it open. They would use a drill, not, a, not an ax, so they stay quiet. And they would, by the head, drag the body out. Sometimes they use a hook under the chin, like you would hang a fish up. Really gruesome, except that caused a lot of damage to the skull and stuff, and they didn't, they didn't like that, the doctors. So, I'll give you a view here. It's a, it's a beautiful view. Very hilly terrain here in this part of Ohio. There's some farm fields, but it's got a lot of a lot of wooded area. I'm not seeing Maxwell, guys. I'm not sure we're going to have luck here. We can go down here. We've got kind of one more run. Let's take a look down this way. I see an interesting interesting stone here. Interesting marker. Look at that. I see toys. So normally that would be children. Let's see what it says. Straighten this out. All right, we got Nancy Lee. Let's see, 1944.
This is just some loose moss. So this is okay to do. Gotta be really careful though. David, Paul. Uh, bless this, I think, 1952 to 2011. Hmm. These look like prayers. Yeah. Got some newer stones here. Hmm. Now well, let's see what's up here. Let's make sure we don't miss anything. So again, the other cemeteries don't have a, uh, anybody listed. It doesn't mean there's not somebody buried here or there that did not that died in late 1880. That's what we're looking for because the articles came out January 1881. That's kind of the big clue we're using. Nothing yet, guys. Nothing yet. I don't think I've missed anything. I don't know if we looked at this one. Ooh, it's pretty hot. It's like 90. 90 and humid, Susan. Died at 18 years old. Daughter of Eleanor Rosenberg. Looks like. Died in 1861. Wow. This is indeed old. So figuring that probably surrounding, surrounding five to ten mile radius, there's no one that we can find that died late 1880. That's Maxwell's got to be the one. Oh, here's a Maxwell. I'm sorry, it's not Maxwell, it's Maxfield. Yes, Maxfield. Maxfield, this is it. Well, maybe this is the plot marker. I don't see William. Rhoda. She died in 1881. Hey, here we go, guys. This is it. Now, what we didn't know is his wife also died just before him. This, he must be on the other side, says uh, father and mother. Okay, this is it. We did it. We did it. We found it. William Maxfield died December 2nd, 1880, age 79. December 2nd. Now, the question is, first question is, let's not step over where... Hopefully there's no more, there's no more torpedoes if this is it. I don't want to get blown up, guys. <laughs> I doubt it. I'm sure a ton of people and lawnmowers have crossed this. I don't think we have anything to worry about, but just the same. Now, here's some new news. This, this is, this, I'm putting this at 80% to 90% now. You know why? Because his wife died the middle of the year, the middle of the summer. And I'm thinking that... She certainly was buried in late July or, you know, within a week of July 11th because they didn't have embalming. Well, they did, but they, you know, out here in the rural, they would bury right away. So fresh grave, six months later, still maybe fresh enough, but maybe they were going to get a twofer and get William too, or maybe just William. But certainly the news of a husband and wife dying within months made its way around the territory. So I'm going to say there's a good chance that we have found the grave, the torpedo grave. 
So as we stand here, I'm thinking more and more on this, kind of putting the puzzle pieces together. And it seems to me, Rhoda, so Rhoda dies, she's, she dies July 11th, 1881. And I'm going to bet you that she, they put the torpedoes in for her. I am betting that the torpedoes were here the whole time. And maybe more were put when her husband was put here, when he was buried, who knows. But I will bet you the torpedoes, because uh, usually they, for some reason, they did it more for the women, as they were buried many times with their jewelry, and husbands wanting to protect their wives or the mothers. They, I, I don't know, I just, I, I'm betting in July, when she was buried, late July, that's when the torpedoes were uh, placed, but who knows? Now, if you all want to do some research, and if you're able to find uh, other graves that, you know, late 1880, that would be it. Let's, let's keep at it, but I think this is it. I had no idea his wife also died, same year. All right, guys, I would say I would say it was worth the drive, wouldn't you? All right, seven hours back. Hope you enjoyed it. It was worth it. It was worth it. All right, see you guys. Stay safe, all right?